Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Our Warming Planet Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation webinar series. We typically have participants joining from across the world. So thank you for being here. Let's give everyone a couple of minutes to join and then we can get started. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. We will begin in a couple of minutes. Thank you everyone for joining. We'll get started in just one minute. It's 10.01 local time here in New York. We'll give everyone another minute and we will begin. Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar series, Our Warming Planet Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. We typically have participants from across the world, so thank you for joining us today. Today we have two great lectures featuring Robert Nichols and Joseph Alcamo on two critically important topics. And let's uh, begin with an introduction to the book that this webinar is based off of and then uh, we can get started. Great, thank you. Um, so let me introduce the editors of uh, the book, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. This book is in honor of Martin Parry, who is um, a pioneer in the field of climate change impacts and played a key role in the 2007 IPCC reports Martin is a visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. He was co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 2 in 2007 that was on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and has been a convening lead author on three IPCC assessments. He has been a professor of geography at the University of Oxford, University College London, East Anglia, and Birmingham in the UK. Uh, we have Cynthia Rosenzweig, who um, really spearheaded this initiative. Uh, this is uh, the second book in the series, and Cynthia is a series editor as well. Cynthia is a senior research scientist um, at uh, the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and at Columbia University, where she leads the Climate Impacts Group. She co-founded the Agricultural Model into Comparison and Improvement Project, AGMEP. She was a coordinating lead author for several IPCC assessments, and Cynthia was named one of nature's 10 people who mattered in 2012 and has been a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. And then you have me as well. So we want to, um, you've heard a little bit about the editors and you'll hear about our speakers very shortly, but we also want to get to know the audience. So we've prepared um, a poll that we'll run just to get a sense of where all of you are from. Uh, on to the next uh, slide, Jen, thank you. Uh, and before we do that, um, just to give you a sense of the book and the webinar series. Uh, so this is, um, these are the topics and authors of the book. We uh, begin with an introduction to uh, climate science. Then we have a section on methods and approaches. Uh, impacts on sectors, so that's where we are. Um, then we have effects on different regions and countries and policy and practice. Um, on to the next slide, please. So today's agenda um, is 
<clears throat> the introduction and getting to know the audience, which we'll do shortly. Then we have Robert Nichols talking about the consequences of sea level rise for coastal regions. And then we have Joseph Alcamo, who will speak to us about climate change and the future of water. After each of the lectures, we will have a live Q&A session that will be moderated by Jen Evans. And then we'll move on to a discussion on where next for impacts and adaptation. Uh, I'll be moderating that. And uh, typically we have um, other authors from the series joining us. So uh, if they're on, we will make them panelists and they can join this discussion as well. Uh, the audience will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions using the Q&A box as well. Then we have Jen Evans uh, sharing some NASA educational resources that can um, supplement this, um, what you see today. And then we'll uh, do a brief wrap up and we'll also tell you where you can find the recordings of past uh, lectures as well. And to the next slide. Great, and we'll move on to the next slide as well. And then I'll begin the poll. So this is the book and uh, you can get 30% off by using uh, the discount code you see above. So um, when we, uh, sometimes we are lucky and we have uh, participants uh, joining from all geographical regions, but I know that the time is not uh, feasible. We've tried to fix it in the morning New York time, which gives us uh, sort of, uh, you know, time that works for most regions, unfortunately not all. So let's get started by launching the poll. And please vote and tell us um, where you're from. And um, then I can also share. So I'll have this on for about 30 seconds. Uh, we'd like as many of you to participate as possible. And then I'll share the results. And um, so far, I'm seeing most regions. Um, give it a few more seconds, and we'll see where everyone's from. OK, we have over 80% of the participants vote, uh, voting. So this is great. So let me end the poll and share the results. So there you go. So we have. Um, you know, some participation from Africa and Asia. I know the time doesn't work really too well for those regions, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, North America. I think uh, Oceania is tough because it's, it's uh, probably past midnight there. Great. Next, we want to uh, get a sense of um, what sector you work in. So uh, please um, fill this out and we'll give you all about 30 seconds. Great, you know, typically we have um, people joining from all sectors and um, it's amazing to see uh, the breadth of sectors that all of you are from. So now we have over 80% of the audience that have participated in this. So I'm gonna end the poll and um, share the results. So this is fantastic. As you can see, we have um, all sectors um, represented. Um, we also have uh, a number of people who don't fall into any of these categories. So, you know, when you do your introductions in the chat function in a little bit, we'd love to hear, you know, which other sectors you're from. Okay, and we have one final uh, poll question, and this is to get a sense of your involvement um, in climate change. So please go ahead um, and we can get a better sense of your involvement. And once again, we really see a range of uh, levels of involvement. And uh, that's really the idea is to have this available to as many people working in as many sectors as possible. And hopefully it'll be a useful resource. So once again, we have um, just going to keep it up for a few more seconds. Uh, we have about 80% of the audience that have participated in this as well. So let me end the poll and share the results. So this is great. We have uh, people who work directly with some with linkages, some want to be more involved. 
uh, someone to educate people about climate change or learn more. So this is really fantastic. Uh, so welcome everyone. We would also like to, um, while this is going on at any point, uh, you know, feel free to begin um, introducing yourselves in the chat function. We'd, you know, share as um, much or as little information as you like. So, you know, you could include your name, uh, country, institution, role, your email, if you'd like to connect with other people. And we'd also like to know how you think this book might help you. So I'm just gonna, use the chat function and put that over here so that you can uh, you know start introducing yourselves and uh, we can now get started um, on the lectures so Jen to the next slide please fantastic thank you I would love to uh, introduce you all to our first speaker Robert J. Nichols. Robert Nichols is a professor of climate adaptation at the University of East Anglia. He's also director of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research. He's co-chair of the World Climate Research Program Grand Challenge on Regional Sea Level Change and its Impacts. Robert was a coordinating lead author of IPCC Working Group 2, Fourth Assessment Report. His research focuses on integrated assessment and changing coastal systems, especially the possible effects of sea level rise and climate change. Thank you very much for joining us today, Robert. Um, and over to you to begin sharing your screen. Thank you. Robert, you're on mute, so I will, um, great. We don't hear you yet, but... Can you okay. hear me now? We can, yes. Thank you. Sorry, Robert. yeah, I'll share my screen. Um, yes. And uh, now what am I doing here? I'm just sorry. Okay. I, yes. Uh, right. And it always, it always goes well until you try and do it for real, eh? <laughs> oh, no, I think you're, you're on the right track. We can make it full screen. Um, no, I'm just looking for that. I'm looking for that. Lower yes. right corner. That's it. Okay, yes. perfect. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Great, Robert. Over to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to have been part of this book. And I'm very pleased to be here today sharing some thoughts with you on a topic I've worked on for a lot of my li working life. And I guess the goal here is really to sort of, I want to communicate some general sort of principles about, I think, how we can best kind of conceptualize sea level rise. So as the science moves forward, I think the ways that I'm thinking about the problem, I think will kind of be conserved. So if we go through, if we go through and think about the coast, first of all, and step away from sea level rise and look at what's happened in the coast over the last, say, 120 years, you know, in the 20th, early 20th, 21st centuries, and what we see are really rising local, regional, and global risks. And it's due to a lot of different factors, population and economy. There's lots, the population of the coastal zone has grown dramatically. They're moving to urban areas. And we have things like tourism, recreation, and retirement growing. We have areas that are sinking as well. I mean, there's hundreds of millions of people living in deltas, some, of the, some urban areas, some rural areas, um, which are sinking. So the sea level is rising, not because of climate change, because the land is sinking, and that's a significant effect. We have globalization of trade and shipping routes, so that's changing how our economy works, growth of ports and lots of coastal infrastructure to support that activity. Coastal disasters are becoming uh, more and more costly. And, you know, in part, that's due to, I think, lots of factors, but the fact is more stuff on the coast to be damaged should not be underrated when you're looking at the cost of disasters. Then we have climate change and sea level rise has been occurring over the last 120 years and been contributing to this trend. We have a reactive approach to adaptation. I think that's an important point to note that historically, we have really not um, we, we, we can see that disaster is coming, but we tend to do things after we experience a disaster. We're not proactive. And lastly, we have degrading coastal habitats and declining 
ecosystem services, and that which often includes the sort of protection function of um, of ecosystems. So that's again increasing increasing coastal risks. And so I think the key point is that climate change and sea level rise is happening in a very dynamic context, and lots and lots of things are are changing. And in the future, we expect climate change and sea level rise to become more important. How important will really depend on how well we sort of uh, how well we um, adhere to the Paris Agreement or not. But it's still going to be happening in this chain, in, 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 this, in this way. So I think it brings out the point that really when we think about the coast and we think about sea level rise, it's best to think about it in a system sense. And this is the diagram we actually used in the AR4. So when I was CLA of the, of the coastal chapter, and this is how we sort of conceptualize the coast with a natural components interacting with the human components in the coast climate change happening it's more than it's more than sea level it's the climate is affecting the coast in a number of different ways both directly and also by changing the sea it will influence the, the marine environment and also by influencing the terrestrial environment for example runoff from the from the from the land and you can you can extend this you know that was just a, a systems diagram that showed climate well we can also bring in some of the non-climate drivers that my list before was showing and these factors all, all sort of all relate there so i think it's really important when we think about when we think about um, the impacts to recognize the coast will be evolving as sea level rises and uh, and to take that into account and we're going to get a much more realistic view of the threats and we'll get much more realistic view of how we can respond to those threats i think if we take that on board so now moving to sea level rise and what it, well what is sea level and the US actually, you know, we're talking here, I am it, the convened from New York, but the US has the best records of sea level rise, sort of sea level change in the world, um, uh, due, you know, due mainly to sort of tide gauges run by NOAA. So this record here goes back, it's Florida, it's basically northern Florida, Jacksonville. It goes back to 1890 up to uh, nearly 2020. And this is monthly sea level. So basically, it's a tide gauge. It's measured sea level. It's the average uh, every month for that period. There are gaps. But what you can see is there's a rising trend. Um, it's about two millimeters per year at this, at this point on the Florida coast, which is quite similar to what we think happened globally. So Florida, this part of Florida is responding rather like maybe the, the sort of the, the, the globe is has been responding. But if we go somewhere else, let's go to Grand Isle, Louisiana. So we're going to the Gulf of Mexico now. And we're actually in the Mississippi Delta. And I mentioned that deltas are sinking. And we see a much more rapid rise in um, sea level, nine millimeters per year of sea level rise. And keeping on going, let's go all the way to, the, to um, Alaska, Juneau, Alaska. The record here is shorter, it, I mean, as it was with Louisiana, it starts in 1940. And here, sea level is actually falling. It's falling at more than, uh, more than a centimetre per year. It's 13 millimetre per year drop in sea level. So it's sea level fall. So, so um, what's going on? And it brings out the point that when we're thinking about um, sea level, a tide gauge measures relative sea level. And relative sea level is composed of a number of different components. The first component is global. So it's the changing ocean volume. And that's what we're concerned about with climate change. So global warming is increasing the ocean volume due to thermal expansion of seawater and the melting of land-based ice. But then there are regional components as well, things like climate variability, which influences um, sea level on sort of uh, annual decadal sort of varies, things like El Nino. There are geological trends, the lands rising and sinking. And then we have local components as well. And not, it's not universal, but sometimes these human induced components can be important um, in, in locally. Um, so, so we have to think about all these. And when we think about impacts and adaptation of sea level rise, we need to consider relative sea level change 
Um, so, so that's what actually causes the impact. So Juneau, Alaska is not threatened by sea level rise because the land there is rising very rapidly. There was a large ice sheet there and the, the ice sheet has been removed you know, thousands of years ago, but the land is still responding to that. So we have this rise in land, a fall in sea level. In Louisiana, we have the Delta sinking. So it's, it's exacerbating climate change. So we always have to downscale these global components to the local situation to really understand what's going on. Most places are gonna see a positive rise, a, a rise in relative sea level, but a few places uh, might not, such as Juneau, Alaska. This is from the AR5. So this is, I mean, there's now been, we've had the six assessment report published uh, recently, about a year ago, but I like this picture because it captures what the global component of sea level has been doing from 1700 up to, up to 2000, and then on with projections to 2100. And we, uh, and we can see the different kinds of data that we use to understand this. So first of all, from 1700 up to sort of the early part of the 20th century, it's geological data. Sea level seems to have been pretty constant in that period, but there's quite a lot of uncertainty and we're using sort of marsh cores and things, geological information to understand what sea level's doing. Then we move into the 20th century, we have the green and orange lines appearing. They are based on tide gauges, so a different sort of data, taking the, some of the data I showed you a moment ago and trying to come up with a global interpretation of that data. And you can see that sea level is, um, is now rising, global sea levels rising in the 20th century. So it's behaving differently to the way it behaved in the previous centuries. Then we get the little blue, as uh, you can see my mouse, the little blue area, which is the beginning of satellite measurements, Topex Poseidon. So we actually have altimeters and we start to sample the entire ocean and that's showing a rising trend and it's rising faster than the tide gauges. So we are seeing an acceleration in sea level rise um, through these measurements. And then we have prognosis where we, again, these are particular models. I mean, the, the, the AR, AR6 has, has slightly different results, but qualitatively, it's broadly the same. We have the blue line, which is related to low emissions, something similar to the Paris Agreement. It's, R, it's RCP 2.6, uh, where we have a, a rising trend and sea levels keeps on rising if we even if we follow the Paris Agreement. That's an important point to note. We'll come back to that. Or we have the red line. We have um, and it, we have an accelerate, we have high emissions and we have uh, much higher rates of sea level rise and it's accelerating um, through the 21st century. So um, quite, so, uh, so we have quite big differences depending on how we behave with emissions, particularly by the end of the, uh, of the 21st century. And when we think about the climate induced global sea level rise, what are the components that are really driving it? Well, one, as the, as the world warms, we get thermal expansion of seawater, the same mass occupies a larger volume. And then we get melting of land-based ice. The small glaciers like in the Rockies and Alaska, the Alps, the Himalayas, they're retreating pretty much um, in most places. But then we have the sort of sleeping giants, the Greenland ice sheet, and then Antarctica, particularly the West Antarctic ice sheet. So Greenland has about seven meters of sea level equivalent in it. West Antarctica has about sort of three, four, five meters of sea level equivalent in it. And Antarctica as a whole is about 70 meters of um, sea level equivalent. So, um, so um, but West Antarctica is considered to be the part of the, of the Antarctica that's most likely um, to become destabilized um, first. And looking on at Antarctica, you know, we have we also get um, papers like this. This is this is to Conto and Pollard, published in 2016 in Nature. I think it was the most cited paper that year published um, in Nature, talking about Antarctica and what it might contribute to sea level. And here is the quote that really worried people about, you know, we could get more than a meter of sea level rise from Antarctica by 2100 with a high end. Um, global warming and 15 meters. So that means actually it's more than the West Antarctic ice sheet. It's actually some of East Antarctica being lost if emissions continue unabated. So th there, is, um, there is risks of very large changes. And I think it brings back to this IPCC figure that I added this blue dashed line with question marks that even if we have the sort of the mean 
and, 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 and the sort of and, and what we expect around it, the sort of 66 percent are what we ex sort of our best estimate of what will happen. That's changed in AR6. Um, we still have this deep uncertainty and there are low likelihood, high, um, high, uh, large rise changes possible. Um, it's hard to quantify that, but we need to remember that, that, that those cases do exist, even if they are unlikely. If we think about sea level, what are the effects of sea level? Why do we care about sea level? I think it's pretty self-evident to most people, but it's good to sort of think about these effects that Inundation, flooding, and storm surge. Basically, the sea rises and it tends to submerge the, the land around it, both permanently and during storms, etc., temporarily. So it can be surges, and also it will actually even uh, reduce the runoff of rivers. So it will actually causes the backwater effect. It'll actually cause wetland. It'll degrade ecosystems, so wetland loss and have effects on other ecosystems. It causes erosion of soft morphology uh, of beaches, cliffs, etc. It causes salt water intrusion both into surface water, so salt water will penetrate further into estuaries, up rivers, and into groundwater, and it raises water tables. So those are sort of five of the effects of the main effects of, of, of a relative rise in sea level. Um, and you know you could you can think of other effects, but they're they're the major ones. And critically. They interact with other effects of climate change shown here and other non-climate effects. So going back to that systems thinking, when you want to sort of downscale what's going to happen in any particular place, you've got to look at the local context and take consideration of the other factors which will influence the how the, the natural system effect of sea level will be, will be felt. Um, thinking about that, that's a sort of physical view. How will that affect the economy and sort of human well-being? And here we we produced a, a diagram which sort of looked at different sectors, and then just basically put a a, a, a bold blue arrow if we think it's a large effect, uh, a a, a, um, a a light blue arrow if it's sort of um, not so strong, and a dash if we're not really sure. And First of all, to note, we could find no, we were asked in AR4, and this is I think still true today, where are the positives in sea level? And we couldn't find any really in terms of, no, in terms of direct effects of sea level rise, there are no real positive effects for the for, for coastal areas. And there are an awful lot of, ne of a negative effects where we're confident about the negative um, impacts. And then thinking about the consequences, well, millions of people live in the coastal zone. In fact, you know, hundreds of millions of people live below 10 meters. That we we'll often talk about the low elevation coastal zone. And so these pictures here are just showing you what kinds of impacts um, might occur if we um, if sea level rose and how many people would be flooded uh, with two different digital elevation models. So the results differ depending on what we assume about elevation, and that's that is an uncertainty. And then different different RCPs, 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. And I think the, the take-home message really, um, if you look at these two pictures here, which is without adaptation or without any additional adaptation, I should say, that quite quickly you have, and um, with when this is down here with temperature rise here not sea level, so it's different the degrees of how much warming we get, you're getting hundreds of millions of people uh, experiencing flooding per year. So huge impact. We haven't quantified it economically in these pictures, just quantifying it by human experience of flooding. It is important to note that if we think about actually enhanced protection, and we, which means we're building dikes everywhere. I mean, this may not be possible, but just to, then actually we can see a scenario where we're seeing a reduction um, in the number of people being flooded, even though sea level is rising. So it brings out the important point that it's very important to think about adaptation when we're thinking about these issues. And the world in the 20th and 21st centuries has adapted to extreme water levels. So we'd expect that to continue in the 21st century. Where are the main areas we're concerned about? Well, we're particularly concerned about small islands, we're particularly concerned about deltas, and we're particularly concerned about coastal cities. Those are the three locations where this matters the most. And if we look at the geography of the world, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia is where 75% of
of the low elevation coastal zone population live. So it's a real hotspot. It's, it's where most adaptation needs to happen. So these are areas which we're particularly concerned about. There are also areas which are often seeing subsidence. So there's an exacerbation of climate-induced changes via um, locally uh, induced effects as well, which is making it even worse. And also, um, in the terms of the small islands, um, probably in many ways, this, the effect here is the most existential, but the Pacific islands, um, the Indian Ocean islands and the Caribbean are th the th sort of three regions which are of um, particular um, concern. Um, in maybe in, in relative terms, where, where the whole, where, you know, islands could be um, completely lost due to sea level rise. So then moving on, well, how can we respond to this challenge? What, what are our options? And there are essentially, um, there are essentially uh, the option of mitigation. You know, that's the Paris Agreement. We can think about source control, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And also, I mean, I should note, I think we should also be reducing these human-induced substance as well. That's another form of mitigation. It's not what the Paris Agreement covers, but um, in the context of sea level, it certainly would be a wise thing to do if you're in an area where the land is sinking. Or we can think about adaptation, behavioral changes to manage the risk. And let's one slide, first of all, on looking at um, what um, mitigation might mean. And this picture here shows, the top panel is showing you temperature rise. And so the red, panel, the red, the red information is high emissions, RCP 8.5, and we're seeing a very rapid rise in temperature here, and this is going through to 2300. You need to go beyond 2100, really, with sea level um, to really understand the long-term consequences of these kinds um, of decisions. So by 2300, the temperature, the, so the, 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 the median temperature is well above, um, you know, with RCP 8.5, well above five degrees, and there's a large range of uncertainty around that. If we, ha if we hold um, temperature at two degrees or 1.5 degrees, you can see that we get the blue and the gray, the gray lines, it's in, in the model, the, the model holds the temperatures uh, constant by, um, by, by sort of regulating CO2 emissions in this sort of experiment. And below the panel shows, well, what effect does this have on sea level? And so in the model, we're getting up to sort of maybe four meters of sea level with unmitigated emissions by um, 2300. By 2100, it's more like um, a little bit less than one meter, but it just keeps on rising. And we need to change the scale to be able to show it. Um, with the blue and the gray lines, it's important to note, though, if we do achieve the Paris Agreement, you know, including 1.5 degrees, sea level is still rising. And we sort of saw that in some of the plots I showed before. And I think this is an important point to, to recognize that when you stabilize temperature, you don't stabilize sea level. You stabilize the rate of sea level rise. So it's, sea level is not accelerating, but it's still rising at um, a linear so at a sort of almost constant linear rate, and that will continue um, for quite long periods um, of time. And if we look at the, the, therefore the effect of peoples, a little bit like the plots I showed a moment ago, so people flooded as an indicator, if we have the uh, unmitigated un uh, emissions, hundreds of millions of people have been flooded. This assumes they don't move, by the way, so there are maybe some important assumptions to note here. But even with the um, 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees, we're still seeing l a large growth in the number of people who are flooded um, unless we think about um, adaptation uh, and that panel there. So I think the kind of key message here is even with stringent climate mitigation, we have to think about adaptation to the residual rise um, in sea level. And really the best response um, to um, sea level rise, climate induced sea level rise is stringent mitigation and then um, adaptation to the, resi to, the, to the residual rise. And, that, and that, that adaptation will have to go on far into the future. So, our children will have to do more than we do, and our grandchildren will have to do more than they do, and so on. So you're also going to think about adaptation in a number of steps, really, and that's, again, another important point. Adaptation is going to be a process. It's not something you can do once. It's something you're going to have to do again and again. If we think about 
what adaptation means. This goes back all the way to the IPCC assessment in 1990. They came up with three ways of adapting to sea level rise. We can have a retreat um, where we move back. We can accommodate, we can change how we use the land by maybe raising, our, making our houses more, or a way of living more flood proof. Or we can protect, we can build a barrier that can be hard or soft. And the, on the right, you see sort of images sort of illustrating those uh, three policies and implementation uh, within the UK. How has that evolved? Well, really, this, this approach has pretty much stood the test of time, but it has been um, augmented. Um, first of all, at the bottom, I think we recognize now that in many parts of the world, people have built out into the sea in the 20th and early 21st century, and that is continuing in places, particularly in Asia. Um, and so you have this advance. And so if you're going to do that, you need to be thinking about sea level rise. And if you're going to be building new land, it has to be higher. You have to factor in elevation to deal with sea level rise. It's not a permanent solution, but it buys it buys time. So that's 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 uh, advance or attack. Sometimes people call it. Um, we also have information measures. So we have much, much, we have ever improving models that allow us to really um, see major events coming and be much more prepared. So we have, so we are able to really be much better. We, 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 we shouldn't now be surprised by floods. In some places in the world we are, but there's no reason really. We, a disaster preparedness should be a priority to augment all this other adaptation. And we also have tremendous growth in the use an in, well, interest in and use of nature-based adaptation. And this is a huge R&D, I think, area where um, we're, we're learning now how we can, in a sense, you, we, we've got classical, the classic dike, and we're now learning to understand nature in the same way we understand dikes and engineered interventions so that we can understand the benefits of nature. And if we enhance nature, we can understand the adaptation benefits that that gives us. So that, and, and, and again, that's sort of about getting the multiple benefits, um, more, more than just the, 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 the sort of the, the adaptation to sea level rise, we're getting other benefits by having nature. And so those are sort of three important trends. So, um, well, and, and I think, it, again, an important point to, to, to note um, that I was going to say about those, and remembering that all those measures, I think, we'll be talking about using them basically along some kind of adaptation pathway. We won't be, we won't be just doing a one-off. We'll be thinking about doing something today, and then at some time in the future, depending on the decision, we'll be having to upgrade or do differently, it'll obviously depend on the, on the context on how we do that, but that principle of adaptation being a process. So just some concluding remarks now then. So I think um, sea level rise is certain. I think that's, I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty confident sea level is going to rise. The rate is highly uncertain and it depends on future greenhouse gas emissions. It depends on the sensitivity of the climate, so how much warming we get in response to those emissions, and the ice sheet response, which is, again, in physical terms, is still poorly understood. There are several distinct impacts of sea level rise, and a global one meter rise could lead to hundreds of millions of people being flooded. But that does assume no adaptation, so it is actually a worst kind of case view, so it's always worth remembering that. Even if we follow the Paris Agreement, sea levels will continue to rise more slowly. So we, we know we're making the problem much more manageable, um, but there will still be some resulting impacts and there'll be a need to adapt in addition to climate mitigation. So you might say there's a commitment to adapt as well uh, uh, under that scenario. Adaptation can take many forms. You know, we can think about protection, we can have hard, soft, and also this increasing use in ecosystem-based approaches accommodation or retreat, and we probably could put the advance in there as well. And I think if we think about adaptation, we should be thinking about adopting a flexible and innovative approach, because I think we, we, we are learning a lot as we go forward. Our technology is improving, you know, the warnings I mentioned, that's something that's really developed in the last 
30 years in through my career i've seen that that really develop so so that we can sort of adjust and learn as we move forward and also we'll understand better how much sea level rise we'll have to deal with in the future um, so that we can we can make better decisions in the future so i think it's an important point to really take into account this need for flexible flexibility and innovation as we move forward so thank you very much Thank you so much, Robert. That was fantastic and very comprehensive. And uh, I would encourage the audience to type your questions into the Q&A box and uh, Jen will moderate the questions. Over to you, Jen. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you, Robert. Um, so we do have a couple questions already. So from uh, Joel Smith, what kinds of adaptations are we seeing in response to sea level rise? Is there much evidence of retreat or accommodation or is it mostly defense or even advance? Um, I think we are seeing a lot of advance, Joel. I think advance mainly reflects a shortage of land. So I'm not sure it's really adaptation to sea level rise. The advance is almost a land scarcity issue. And I think we're advocating that if you're going to follow that strategy, you should be thinking about sea level rise strategically when you're doing that. We are seeing, uh, certainly in Europe, quite, an, and I think um, uh, and Asia, we're seeing a lot, of, quite a lot of protection um, as well, and an and upgraded protection. Um, in the UK, we're certainly seeing examples of accommodate, so people. We, we have defined, we now know flood levels and we, um, and we have sea level scenarios. So when people build a house, they have to elevate it so that it won't be flooded by the 100 year flood in the next 50 years. So, I mean, so, the, so sort of codes and, and, and I think very similar to some of the things that FEMA does actually in, in, in the US certainly is happening um, in, in, the, in the UK. And um, we are seeing some retreat, but not really very much. In the UK, we've seen a lot of habitat creation. So defences have been pulled back, but mainly to actually uh, in, it, it sustain um, intertidal habitat, which is being lost. Um, and, um, you know, and I think certainly uh, there, are, there are places in the UK where there's erosion and we, we, we are seeing individual properties um, being lost. In one or two places, um, a place called Fairbourne in um, Wales, it's a village, it's the first place in the UK where they've said, we cannot protect this place and it's going to be abandoned. And it's causing uh, quite a lot of discussion and debate. Um, but I think um, there are many Fairborns in the future. So I think uh, speaking from, you know, speaking in my, from One Nation's context, the UK, we're probably gonna see a lot more of this. And, I, and, and, and so I think, there's, there's a, there's a, it's, it's really a very mixed bag that we're seeing of, of responses. And um, I think the retreat um, hasn't really been grappled with very much to date because politically um, politicians are, are rather nervous of the retreat option. Great, okay. We have a lot of questions coming in. So the next one um, from Ro S. Uh, says, as you said, people are reactive and not proactive. It seems important to determine costs of short-term sea level rise at a regional basis to get people active. What efforts are you seeing toward determining these short-term costs? Um, well, I think, um, absolutely. I mean, I think basically I would argue that you ought to be seeing long-term planning in all kind of coastal areas. I mean, in, in, in many of the cities in Northwest Europe, they've been thinking 100 even more years into the future about what they might do under different scenarios of sea level rise. And I, I would argue that should be rolled out across all coastal cities where you have, in fact, it can be done anywhere, but coastal cities, there's so much at stake. And it, it's, it's wise to think about what sea level rise might do and what, and therefore what decisions you might take um, differently. And I think it's particularly um, when you're going to develop new things, you might build them differently, you might build them in different locations, you might build them in different ways, etc. Um, so so, so I, think, I think there needs to be a lot more proactive assessment, really, and I think maybe brainstorming about the issues. I think probably going to your costing question 
is right. But I think that probably you need to sort of almost start with um, asking just, just some broad brainstorming, framing the problem, and then you can find the indicators that work for you because it will be different in different places. Okay, so I think this next question is a bit related to that as well. So uh, Nicole Daniel says, what is your opinion on seawalls as a solution in terms of, uh, sorry, <laughs> what is your opinion on seawalls as a solution? Thinking about how rich cities, Miami and Manhattan, for example, re will receive the resources compared to less affluent communities, Louisiana cities and the Gulf. Well, I think there's going to be a differential response um, for sure. I mean, uh, some recent work um, has looked at kind of if you if you would, if you apply apply a benefit cost approach. I'm not saying we should apply a benefit cost approach, but it's a kind of rational way of allocating resources. I think it's informative, makes one think. Um, if you um, it, you you can you can protect. Um, an awful lot of the assets that are threatened are concentrated in a few small areas. So by protecting certain areas, you, you can protect most of the people and, and, and most of the assets. But that does mean elsewhere, people are not being protected and you're seeing retreat. So you're seeing different responses along different parts um, of the world's, um, world's coasts. Um, and I think probably from a sort of rational point of view, um, that makes sense. I think one of the key points though about, um, about following that strategy through is that if you follow these differential policies, the people that have to retreat should be receiving help in retreat. The people that are getting the benefits of protection um, should, uh, sh shouldn't be the only people that benefit. It should be the people that are retreating should also be being helped um, in an appropriate way to deal with the issues of sea level rise. In a technical sense, I think seawalls um, or dikes, um, I mean, uh, they, they, they work. I mean, I think the, the, one, the, the one thing I would say is residual risk. Um, if they fail, you can get pretty horrible consequences. Hurricane Katrina shows that. So you've really got to think through the issue of residual risk if you're going to follow that strategy. And also, I think governance. Seawalls are forever and you've, you've got to maintain them. And, you, and that costs money. And I think people, governments are pretty good at building things uh, and, uh, and cutting a ribbon on a new high wall. But maintaining it isn't quite so... Um, so, so, so sexy, should we say? So uh, it doesn't get you so many votes, um, and uh, it gets neglected. So I think the governance and maintenance, and in many ways, you could say the problems in New Orleans were a failure in part of 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 maintenance. Um, you know, Katrina Katrina teased out that that that, 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 that the dikes had sort of been forgotten about and just taken for granted. Um, and uh, so those are issues that if you're going to follow those strategies, those are two things you have to think very hard about and might be a reason you might take a different strategy if you feel you can't deliver in those areas. Great, okay. The next question is, uh, do you know if property insurance companies are explicitly setting premiums or even willingness to write a policy based on predictions of sea level rise, perhaps in the next 30 year period. And that's from Bob Schloss. Um, insurance companies are certainly um, at the forefront of thinking about, um, about uh, risk, should we say. I mean, I think their time scale is pretty short, typically, because they're often thinking about um, about um, premiums in this year and you know and then how much reinsurance they need and their time but I think that they there is thought about where this is going I mean back to the I made the point about cities should be being proactive and thinking about the future insurance companies are asking questions what's the world going to be like in 10 years 20 years 30 years is is the way we operate now going to be fit for purpose um, in in the in, in that world, or could we go bankrupt? Um, and so there's a lot of thought going on into the issues. I mean, I think there is the the, the point about um, there is the point about um, uh, uh, um, repeat loss, and maybe will will some places become 
uninsurable if you if you live in a particularly vulnerable location where you might get repeat flooding that insurance will not be available to those to those properties so there's an issue there's an issue there to be thought about but i think insurance also actually is a really good lobby for government change because they can then go along and they can they can push for better building standards uh, maybe you know tax breaks if if homes take um take measures to reduce losses and things like that. So I think um, the insurance industry actually, I mean, and, and also the fact they're doing this work, I think it, it is also good. Often it's often maybe it's not publicly available. It would be nice if they could actually say share this, but obviously they, they tend to, but they often feel they're maybe um, in a competitive market. Um, but, but, but I think that the lobbying that the insurance industry can do can, I think, be very, very beneficial for action um, for, 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 for climate change. Um, so, so, so I think there are benefits to what's going on there. Okay, thank you everyone for these questions and for the responses. I think they're bringing up some really great topics. So our next one says, what from Robert Chen, what improvements in data on coastal exposure and vulnerability of people, infrastructure, livelihoods, et cetera, are most needed? Um, I would say probably, what well we could do with better data in all areas really i mean you know there was a paper published earth's future which i'm a co-author on looking at uncertainties in broad scale coastal flood assessments and it brings out the point that there's lots of uncertainties in um, these assessments, and it's not all the it's not all down to how much sea level rises. It's it, it, it's other components. A good did a digital elevation model of the caliber of lidar for the world's coast would really make a huge difference because we still have quite large uncertainties about um, about about coastal um, elevation. Lots of people are working on it, and and this has been improved. Um, and you know, and actually, there's an, there's an there's an there's an initiative right now at, by Deltaris, by the European Union, to produce yet another improvement um, on, on on some of the satellite um, platforms. But elevation, really, I think, um, uh, would be a huge improvement. I think we we actually probably things like where people are and where assets are, we probably know better than the elevation of those people and the elevation um, of of those assets. Uh, and then I think actually um, uh, our some of our, our our sort of modeling of these of these issues um, could also be improved. Although I think that can be that it, uh, sometimes you can sort of search false precision there. I think, um, it, it, and also obviously. Ultimately, the sea level rise scenarios are important. I said that's not the only thing that matters, but I think better information on the Greenland and it's really particularly it's the ice sheets. Um, what will Greenland, what will Antarctica do and when? Timing is everything, really, because um, the, um, the, the, the Conto and Pollard paper in 2016 um, you know, this Tocantos led a more recent paper published in 2021, which is cited in AR6, and that somewhat delays some of the um, the, the consequences of um, of, of deglaciation in Antarctica, and um, which I didn't mention, uh, and that, but that timing means so that's that you're pushing that into the 22nd century, and I think the timing of these things does does matter. Um, and, and also the rate at which it will happen matters even more. Okay, I think we might have time for one more. I know there was a question in the chat that I might not have gotten to. Um, let me see here. Okay, so it says, what is your opinion about the contribution of sediment entering oceans to the rise of sea level? How is it compared to climate change impacts such as melt of glacier slash ice caps? I think it's negligible. And um, the amount of sediment entering the ocean is also diminishing because we're trapping more and more sediment in dams. So that effect has also been reduced by human agency through the 20th, early 21st century, and we're building more dams. So it, the trend, the trend for, I mean, it raises a question. I've, I've been involved in studies about the reduction in sediment supply, and that in fact enhanced, that enhances um, erosion. Uh, as, so it, it makes sea, it makes the effects of sea level rise worse. Um, so I think the more sediment we had at the coast, um, the better actually. So um, 
So, 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 so I mean, you know, I, I'm on several papers that advocate how we need to be trying to learn how to work with sediment. You, in the broad sense of ecosystem-based or nature-based um, approaches, working with sediment is one of the things that we should be encouraging. Okay, so one more, uh, and unfortunately I can't see the name, um, but it says, our students want to know that if we are taught that the amount of water and precipitation is fixed, why are sea levels rising? Well, the, the sea levels are rising because the, 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 ocean is, the ocean is warming, and that means the same mass occupies a larger volume. So basically, the density of the sea is going down. And so that water is spilling, if you like, if you were thinking about a, um, a, 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 a surface, the, 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 that water is expanding. So it's moving on, it's moving on to the uh, bits that are dry. And then the second process is that uh, the second process is that ice um, water, water that's stored in ice form on land is melting in small glaciers, in green in the Greenland ice sheet and Antarctica um, and all three of them now are acting as sources of water that's that's something that's happened uh, it used to be small glaciers through the 20th century Greenland and Antarctica have started to become significant sources in the last 20 or 30 years and so that that ice is being transferred to the ocean so so we're moving the location there's fixed water yes but it's it's fa it's phase. It's becoming some of it's becoming liquid, and its location it's in the ocean is changing. And there is, there is actually an additional small effect which I haven't mentioned, which is um, actually changes to the hydrological um, cycle, and that's actually contributing a little bit. But it, but it's a but it's a fairly small effect, so I don't normally mention it. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for all of those responses. I think there are a couple more questions and you can, unfortunately, we don't have time to get to them, but you can type an answer uh, in the, Robert, in the Q&A, um, but we do have to move on. Thank you everyone for all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for moderating. Uh, yes, the, those are some fantastic questions and we got so many. So thank you, Bob, for answering all of 